droplet spread of infections. So this is a topic that is certainly very broad with a lot of knowledge and facts coming together from different areas of science like infectiology, epidemiology, virology, bacteriology, engineering, and so on. But what I'm going to focus on in this lecture are the basic principles of infections by droplets. The effectiveness of a droplet-borne diseases depend on how far respiratory droplets can move, so how rapidly and strongly they can deposit on surfaces or are filtered out by facial masks and so on. And these principles, as we will see, are based on the laws of physics. So my goal here is to give you an overview of the underlying physics principles on how respiratory droplets spread and behave. So let's first have a look at the occurrences of respiratory viruses through seasons. So respiratory viruses can spread via droplets and here are the data for different respiratory viruses in Europe through several years. And what we see is a profound seasonality pattern that we can see in most of them. So if we have a look at the influenza virus, which is the most famous example, um, we see that influenza appears in colder months, like here, and then it fades away in warmer months, and then comes back again next winter and goes again away next summer and so on. Uh, the seasonality is a typical property of respiratory viruses, even though that for some more than the others. Now, the reasons for the observed seasonality of respiratory viruses are probably several and they are highly debated in the scientific community. Among the others, there is definitely social behavior, so the way we behave in different seasons. So for instance, we are much more indoors in the winter time than in the summertime, or we use public transport much more in winter, or schools are, for instance, open in winter, but not summer, and so on. Now, there are also different environmental factors that contribute to the seasonality, like the UV light can do its job, then a warmer weather probably. And of course, one very important factor, and that is indoor relative humidity. Yes, and this relative humidity is the central part of my story that I will going to tell you today. So why indoor relative humidity? Why not the humidity outside? Well, that's because most of the infections are, of course, happening, we believe, inside buildings. So let's have a look at humidity levels inside through different parts of the year. Now, uh, these are the data for Sweden, but of course we would find similar for different cities in Europe. And here uh, we see a very clear minimum in the humidity in the winter months, which is around 30%. Whereas in the summer months, the humidity goes up to 50%. So that's a big difference. So we're talking about the factor of almost two. Um, now, to repeat, what is a relative humidity? Even though I believe that most of you know, let's repeat it here on the side. So what is relative humidity? This is the ratio between water density in air and saturated water density. Yeah, so that would be the water density of the air that is in equilibrium with liquid water. So this is the outline of my talk composed of three different but related topics. So in the first part I will talk about the physics of droplets and explain the difference between droplet and airborne transmission which is confusing in today's public. In the second part we'll talk about masks, filtrations and whether masks are good. And in the last part, something on the stability of viruses that are kept inside aerosol. So the first part is about droplets. So 
humans are producing droplets because of different kinds of activities ranging from coughing, sneezing, talking, and of course also breathing. Yes, that's right. Even though this is a bit surprising, but already just breathing and not talking at all is producing small tiny droplets, which of course we cannot see by naked eye. And where do they come from? Well, they are generated deeply inside the lungs. This is because of openings and um, collapsing of airway passages. And this is where they are produced. And then, of course, they are exhaled out through the mouth or through the nose. And they are very tiny. So here are the distributions of droplets uh, during talking and coughing. So what we see is that the size distributions are roughly similar, even though that in the case of coughing, the amount is larger which of course we cannot see through, uh, from these graphs. And the majority of the droplets is somewhere here in this window range between 10 and 100 microns. Now, some can be even smaller, some larger. So sneezing can produce even much larger droplets, but of course the majority um, is somewhere here. And these numbers we will keep in mind. And now the question is, what happens to these droplets when they come into the air? Of course, this is a very complex question, but we will start simple and then we'll gradually go into a higher and higher complexity. And at each stage, we'll ask ourselves, what does this com complexity mean and what do we learn from that? Yeah, so let's start very simple. Let's imagine a droplet, water droplet in the air. Um, the most obvious thing there is, is of course that there is a gravitational force pulling on the droplet, which of course we can easily calculate. This is the volume times the water density. So the water droplet will start moving downwards and this motion will be opposed by air drag. Yes, and in our case, this drag is given by the Stokes law, which is proportional to the volume and the radius of the droplet. And here, this eta is the viscosity of the air. So eventually, these two forces will uh, balance each other. So the droplet will start falling down with constant velocity, the so-called terminal velocity, which is given like that here. So it's proportional to the size of the droplet squared. And now I can ask myself, what is a falling time for a droplet that is released from certain height to fall down to the ground? And this is now quite simple. So the time is h divided by this velocity. And I can really express it like that, where this psi is this coefficient here. So the falling time is inversely proportional to the size of the droplet squared. Now, to get some feeling, let's put in some numbers. Now, if the droplet size is one millimeter, then the falling time will be 0.3 seconds. Now, for this result, of course, I also need to take into account the acceleration time and so on, so which is not totally described by this equation. But now, as droplets become smaller and smaller, of course, then this equation becomes very reliable. So for um, one, tenth of a millimeter of the size, the falling time is already three seconds. For 10 microns, it becomes five minutes. And for one micrometer large droplet, this amounts into eight hours approximately. Yeah. Now, of course, this all is under the assumption that this droplet uh, is falling as a rigid body that is not evaporating and also that the atmosphere is totally undisturbed, which of course may not be the case as we will see next. Now, the next obvious thing that will start happening to this droplet when entering the air is of course, it will start evaporating. And um, the evaporation is the next thing that we'll take into account. And this evaporation, this slide will be also a bit more technical. Um, that's because um, 
food operation is such an important phenomenon in our story that I allowed myself for a bit longer mathematical derivation here. But it will give us a very important result. So let's see. We start with a diffusion equation of water vapor, where C is the concentration of water vapor around the droplet. And now the stationary solution in the spherical geometry is given like that. Yeah? Where C0 is the concentration far away. And as we are approaching the droplet, the concentration goes up as 1 over R, this term here, and the coefficient B. For now, it's unknown, but I use a so-called reactive boundary condition, where so J is the density flux of water vapor, which is given by the derivative of the concentration of water vapor, and I relate this to the evaporation and condensation rates. So the first term is the evaporation rate, where Cw is the concentration or density of water in the liquid phase, so in the droplet. And the second term is the condensation rate, where C of R is the concentration of water outside the droplet, so water vapor. Yeah, and these two coefficients, K, are the so-called evaporation and condensation rate, so reaction rate coefficients, which I don't know right now, but of course they can be obtained from a more elaborate uh, molecular kinetic theory, but we will not go into that because we will even not need them. Now from this I can calculate the total flux of the evaporation. So this is the density times the surface area of the droplet and I ended up with this expression here. And now in the next step, this is where the relative humidity enters in the first time and it is given by the C0, so the uh, concentration of water vapor far away from the droplet and the saturated water vapor density. Uh, and now what I know is that uh, the relative humidity equals one, then the evaporation should stop. So J would be zero and I, I can impose this through this term here, right? When, where C0 is now equals C saturated. So uh, using this, I can already eliminate one of the K coefficients and the total flux then can be expressed by the relative humidity in this way, which we see here. Now in the next step, I also realize that the remaining coefficient, so the condensation uh, reaction rate coefficient is, uh, related to the uh, velocity of water molecules in this case, and this is roughly 400 meters per second, which is a large number. And then I realized that this term here in the denominator is much larger than the diffusion coefficient. So using this, neglecting D in this case, you see that then, then the uh, Kc falls out of the equation, and then I ended up with so-called diffusion limited evaporation rate given by that, which is independent of the reaction rate coefficients. So in this limit, the evaporation is limited by the diffusion of water molecules away from the drop. You know, so how fast they are moving, to, moving away and with this making space for the water molecules in the liquid phase to evaporate into the to the vapor. Now with this total flux, now I can also calculate quite easily how fast the whole droplet is shrinking with time. And with this, I can, of course, I obtain the, um, the time dependence of the radius. If you see here, it goes as the square root of one minus something times t, so time. So it looks like that. So the so first the droplet radius decreases linearly with time, and then later on a bit faster. And uh, this evaporation time, so this is the time where the the droplet disappears, is given now this equation here. You see the evaporation time is proportional to the square of the initial droplet size divided by one minus relative humidity. And now let's put in some numbers to get a better feeling. Let's assume 
the relative humidity of 50%, then taking a droplet radius of 100 microns, we obtain the evaporation time based on this equation of 20 seconds. And this is something that everybody um, can see. Uh, so uh, one tenth of a millimeter large droplet on the surface, for instance, we can observe that and we know roughly in 10 seconds, 20 seconds uh, time and the droplet is gone. Now, if a droplet is 10 microns large, then it will evaporate in a fraction of a second, whereas a micron large droplet evaporates in a few milliseconds. So that's quite fast. Here again, so a droplet size versus time, so for different droplet sizes, at different relative humidities, we see that relative humidity increases uh, the evaporation time as governed by this equation here. So we see that if relative humidity approaches 100%, then of course the evaporation time tends to infinity. So now we realize that there is a competition between evaporation and falling. So what happens first? This is now the question. For this, I plot now such a diagram, so time versus a droplet size. And this line first is the time it takes for a droplet to evaporate. And we have seen it goes as r squared. And the other line is the time it takes for a droplet to fall to the ground. And it goes as 1 over r squared. Now, if I take also into account that uh, water droplet is changing with uh, so the radius is uh, shrinking with time while, while falling, then I get corrected curve, which would be like this. But this, is, uh, this uh, correction at the moment is not relevant for our discussions. And uh, there is a critical droplet size uh, where these two times are equal. So falling time equals the evaporation time, now given by this formula here. And uh, water droplets smaller than this critical size will first will evaporate before touching the ground, whereas larger droplets will hit the ground. So these are the so-called Wells evaporation folding curves uh, calculated already in the 30s. And this is not just some uh, pointless uh, contest or something of droplets, but it has a deeper meaning in understanding of droplet transmission. And to understand how uh, this is related to the droplet transmission, we need another element to this story. And this is um, now the next step. Let's assume that our water droplet is no longer pure water, but that it contains some solute molecules inside. Yeah? So these solute molecules can be sodium chloride ions or some proteins or so on. We will use now the concept of uh, chemical potential. And in an approximation, it's a very rough approximation, but it will be good for uh, our discussion. Uh, the chemical potential of water is given by such an expression. So KBT is the temperature. And then I have here a logarithm of the water fraction, XW. Now we see that uh, the more solute I add, the lower is the water fraction, of course, and therefore the chemical potential will go down. So sol adding solute decreases the water chemical potential. On the other hand, the vapor has also its own chemical potential and the expression is given here. So again, KBT times the logarithm of the relative humidity. Uh, now, because the relative humidity is typically below one, then the logarithm is negative, so the chemical potential is negative with respect to the liquid water, which is uh, the reference state here. And now, the chemical potential tells us into which direction the molecules would preferentially go. So they will go into the phase that has lower chemical potential. So typically, where, uh, so at the beginning when the droplet is large, the amount of water is quite large. So the liquid water has larger chemical potential than the vapor phase. So therefore the droplet will start evaporating. 
But of course, uh, with this, uh, uh, if we assume that the solutes do not evaporate, but they stay inside a droplet, then the water fraction will go down and the chemical potential of liquid water here uh, in the droplet will also go down. And eventually, at some point, it will uh, become equal to the water chemical potential. And at that time, the evaporation will stop. And when does this happen? So if we compare the two equations, so the, the, the uh, solution then is uh, very simple. So this will happen when the amount of water will roughly be equal to the relative humidity. And now here, an example how this would look like. Let's say, imagine I have a large water droplet with some solid molecules inside and around vapor with a relative humidity of 50%. And therefore now water will start evaporating from the droplet and it will evaporate so long until the droplet will reach this final stage where according to this equation here, the amount of water will be 50%. And then uh, of course also the amount of solutes would be another 50%. Uh, and here the evaporation stops. So, so this is the an equilibrium structure of uh, the droplet in the vapor phase of 50%. And this is of course now no longer called a water droplet um, because the amount of water is so low, but rather the so-called droplet residue or droplet nucleus. Now let's go to even closer to our goal, so to respiratory droplets. Now let's have a look at the uh, typical composition of our respiratory droplet. So you see the majority is still it's water, but then there are also proteins inside, lipids, carbohydrates, and of course, salt. So these additional non-water components, so represent between two to five weight percent of total mass of a droplet. And then now we know such a droplet in the air will evaporate so that at the end, this dry mass will be preserved and the, the other 50%, so roughly also this amount uh, will be water. So the final residue mass will be between four to 10% of the initial droplet mass. And when looking at the linear sizes, so the final size of a droplet will be around, so between 30 and 50% of the initial droplet size. So why? Because the radius uh, scales as so to the power of one third of the volume or the mass. And now let's have a look at um, typical evaporation of uh, different droplets. So here, uh, the droplet diameter versus time. Now, this black line represents a pure water droplet that evaporates to the end. A water droplet containing salts also evaporates, evaporates, and then the evaporation stops here at certain finite size. Uh, and now calculations for uh, respiratory droplets containing you know, these molecules inside would evaporate a bit slower. This is because of the um, surface effect that are blocking the evaporation. This is not that important for us at the moment, but you see the final uh, droplet size then would be roughly one half of the initial uh, droplet size. So this is what we have also already calculated here. And now with this notion, let's go back to the Wells evaporation falling curve, where now we need to reinterpret the meaning of the uh, evaporation times. And now we need to understand it as a time for a droplet, like a res uh, so respiratory droplet to turn into a droplet residue. Now we can understand what is happening so with respiratory droplets. So the larger ones still they fall on the ground before they stop evaporating, whereas um, smaller droplets uh, will stop evaporating already in the air and those can in principle still fall on the ground, but small, the smaller they are, the more problems they will have to fall on the ground because they will be so light. 
Now, so these very small droplets then turn into even smaller particle residues and eventually they can become aerosol, meaning that they can be suspended for longer time in air and their fate is less predictable. And now with this new interpretation in mind, let's uh, come back to the effect of the relative humidity. We have seen the critical droplet size goes like that. So we see one minus the relative humidity, meaning that if I increase the relative humidity, then the amount of droplets that will fall in the ground will become larger. So this critical size will go to smaller values. Uh, so how to understand this? So now that means that with increasing relative humidity, even smaller droplets will fall on the ground. In other words, that means that more droplet residues will be suspended in the air at lower relative humidity. So this is now, you see, the enormous effect of relative humidity, which controls how fast droplets are evaporating and how many of them fall on the ground. So now in the next stage, we can ask ourselves, um, how far do these respiratory droplets spread? Yeah, because they are typically not released in the air with zero velocity, but, they are exhaled together with air in some jets and fall to the ground in some kind of trajectory. Let's have a look at some typical values of jet velocities. So for breathing, you see it's one meter per second. For talking, like five meters per second, coughing 10 and sneezing can go up to even 50 meters per second. And such kind of things have been also um, calculated, considered. Okay, so let me show you one um, interesting study that um, calculated how far do uh, droplets actually spread if we consider that they are exhaled in some initial uh, jet of air. So these are, you see, these are the coordinates, the vertical distance, the, ho the horizontal distance. So this is the outlet, so like a mouth, so source. So this is now the jet of air with some velocity u naught, and here are the droplets in the middle of this jet that first uh, follow the uh, stream of air and while spreading horizontally they also fall down slowly uh, vertically and in the moment that as they leave the jet they of course then fall down the ground in more or less straight line yeah? so you see the uh, trajectory looks something like that. So it's very straight first and then abruptly turns downwards. So, and um, now we can calculate um, how far do these droplets um, spread. So the horizontal distance as a function of the droplet diameter, we get this kind of curves you see. So uh, here are the droplets that uh, evaporate already in the air jet. And these are, so the larger they are, the with higher probability they fall on the ground. And clearly the faster the jet velocity or the further they will spread. And now let's look at some, uh, so let's say an example of uh, coughing. So that is 10 meters per second. And what we see, uh, at least larger droplets fall down the ground. So that's we can read off here. So you see 1.5 meters. So this is a quite um, familiar number. Uh, familiar in this sense of uh, keeping the distance from the others and nowadays. Um, so 1.5 meters is a typically reported number. And now we understand why is it good for. So it's quite a safe distance if somebody is coughing or uh, talking but of course it's not that safe if somebody is sneezing because then as we see here the droplets can spread even further and of course such studies have been done uh, quite a lot in last years um, even with uh, more profound computer simulation models with all the hydrodynamics of droplets included and calculated numerically. Here, an example of such a study. So these are, uh, this is this, so breathing of small 
droplets at two different relative humidities here as a function of time. Right? So we go from six seconds down to 16 seconds. And now we see here a dramatic effect of uh, the relative humidity again. For very low relative humidity levels, we see that uh, these small droplets will even tend to go up into the air. That's because of the buoyancy effect, because the, the breath has higher temperature uh, than the surrounding air. So the breath has around, let's say, 30 degrees, whereas the air, 20 degrees, which is very bad for you know, spreading the droplets. This, of course, uh, even enhances the spread of the droplets. And then we see here for very large relative humidity, this dramatic effect, basically all the droplets fall down very, very quickly. Such kind of studies more or less come to very similar conclusions, namely that um, there are two different zones of infections. So the first zone is up to the, this famous value, 1.5 meters away from a person, which is so-called droplet transmission. So uh, also danger zone. This is the region where the amount of droplets is very large and potentially also the amount of pathogens very large. Now, the good news is that uh, these droplets are short range because they fell to the ground quite rapidly and uh, of course short lived. The other zone beyond this 1.5 meters uh, co is composed of smaller droplets or aerosols. And this is a so-called airborne transmission. So whatever survives, can then spread much further away in, into the space. So here the amount of droplet is small, so that's why also the amount of pathogens is much smaller. But the bad news is that this zone is very long ranged and very long lived. So now let's say a few words about airborne transmission. So uh, these are the infections that are transmitted by uh, aerosol particles. And let's first start with, again, looking at the Stokes law. So the velocity of a falling small particle is here proportional to the square of its size. Now, uh, typical numbers are given here. These are only hypothetical velocities with which a particle will fall in an undisturbed atmosphere. Now, as it turns out, our atmosphere is far from being undisturbed. Our environment is full of different kinds of um, air disturbances in form of uh, turbulences, convection currents, uh, body plumes, and so on. Yeah? So uh, different kinds of air streams, and these streams will therefore influence the motion of uh, these small particles. Now, in order to predict what would happen, we need now to compare this hypothetical terminal velocity due to gravity with the velocity of a given air stream. Now, uh, so from this, we can conclude that, well, let's say 100 micron large particle will sooner or later deposit due to gravity, for instance. But now, on the other hand, a micron sized particle will never deposit due to gravity. Yeah? So the air stream will simply take that particle with it. And these small particles will then stay in air for extremely long times. They will, of course, deposit to the ground, but very slowly. So now the question, how far do now aerosol particles um, travel? Now I think that now you understand that there is no simple answer. So small particles will remain in the air for very long periods of time, so they can make very long distances in those times. Now, once the aerosol particles do get absorbed, uh, there is also a question how strong the adhesion to a given surface actually is, because what can happen is, of course, also that these particles can get resuspended again into the air. And uh, so a uh, resuspension can happen because of um, 
air streams or a mechanical vibration of the surface and so on. And our suspension is a common concern. Uh, so we wouldn't want that. Now, uh, the adhesion, of course, for solid particles is basically dominated by the van der Waals forces and for liquid particles, there's also a capillary force that is actually much stronger than the van der Waals force. Now, aerosol particles as residues of respiratory droplets are somewhere between these two categories. So they are somewhere between being liquid and solid. Of course, they contain still quite some amount of liquid inside. So therefore, we could expect that both of these two forces will uh, apply. And now to explain uh, what is a capillary force, let me use this simple um, picture. So I have a surface and then a particle on it. So, and now depending on the materials of these two surfaces, I can have here a water film that builds uh, between both uh, surfaces. So, and this amount, so the amount of water film will depend on the relative humidity. So low relative humidity, the amount of water film will be small, larger relative humidity, the amount will be larger. Now, uh, why is this important? Imagine that I want now to remove this particle away from the surface. So what I will start to do, I will start to stretch this liquid film and I will obtain uh, such kind of liquid bridge. And this costs energy. So at a certain distance, I will break the water film, so this capillary bridge. But at the time when this happens, this liquid bridge will, of course, oppose the removal of, of the other surface. Now, the adhesion strength here is proportional to the uh, surface tension of water and the maximal distance before the liquid bridge uh, uh, breaks apart, so D max. Now, we, if we now uh, think about this, so, um, at higher relative humidity, the amount of film will be larger, so therefore also this maximal distance will be larger, so that means that the absorption of the particle will be stronger. Yeah? So another consequence of a relative humidity, namely that the uh, resuspension is less probable. On, on the contrary, at lower relative humidity, of course, more airborne particles can be resuspended again into the air after already being uh, absorbed on, uh, on the surface. Of course, uh, more, let's say, mainstream examples of the capillary pores are uh, these two. So uh, capillary pores, again, is a very strong uh, and it explains uh, why a droplet can uh, hang from the ceiling uh, and the other one is uh, the reason why we can build castles out of moist sand, but not out of dry sand. Now the next topic are masks and filtering of water droplets and aerosols. And now uh, the first question we should ask is not how to filter, but where to filter, right? So what we have learned now is that now when we exhale the air, we exhaled respiratory droplets. These are water droplets basically, and they are large and they react with material via strong capillary forces. So now those particles that survive, those droplets that survive, then they become aerosol. So aerosol is now small, because it's more or less dry, it interacts by a van der Waals forces that are much weaker and in some cases also electrostatically. So you see, these are now two different tasks. So what we want to achieve. So we now have to separate this problem into two problems. Do we want to prevent uh, water droplets to spread out in our surrounding, or do we want to prevent the inhaling of basically small aerosol particles? And for these purposes, of course, we need to also use uh, different kinds of approaches. 
So let's first start with larger droplets and let's just see how good are homemade masks. So uh, this is the topic that was um, highly debated in uh, recent weeks. And for this, I would like to show you one very nice and simple uh, study that uh, studied the effect of um, simple mouth covering on the exhaling of droplets. So the experiment goes like this. So here is a test person that is speaking. Uh, he would say uh, something like stay healthy uh, three times. And then we can uh, monitor the droplets that spread uh, into the air uh, via laser scattering images. So here we see a nice visualization of these droplets and then uh, we can count this. So here are the number of counts as a function of time. So here you see, he say uh, it's worth uh, three times. So you see a profound peaks uh, in the number of uh, counted droplets in his surrounding. So this is without any covering. Now in the next step, he repeated the experiment uh, with the mouth covering. And what we see then is this. So basically nothing, you cannot count any significant spread of droplets into the air. So that means that damp covering significantly suppresses the droplets. So um, what can be counted here are of course droplet sizes that, that are larger than uh, 20 microns of course, but still the effect is enormous. What do we learn from this? So uh, the question, are homemade masks good? So for preventing the spreading of large droplets into the air, then yes, they are very effective. But on the other hand, what about uh, for filtering small aerosol particles? Well, this is a totally different matter. And here I want to show you a study that compares the efficiency of filtering between N95 facial masks and towels and scarves that we have at home. So this study was performed for uh, uh, solid dry sodium chloride particles of very small sub-micron size. So uh, now this is a totally different spectrum of small particles than uh, larger droplets, of course. Now, what we see is that penetration for N95 masks is, of course, below 5%, right? Now, for towels of different brands, now we see that uh, these particles can easily penetrate this. Um, so, with the efficiency of, say, 60% or so, uh, and similar or even a bit worse results for scarves. So what do we learn from this is that, of course, these are not good for filtering smaller aerosol particles, even though that they are, uh, that they still offer a small protection. Again, so this, these are for uh, very small particles, uh, for a bit larger aerosol particles, they can still be a bit better than that. This is what we can expect. And now let's have a look at how such filtering masks actually work. Now, the key thing in aerosol filtration is such kind of fibrous structure. So this is what you find in professional masks. So here, uh, different designs. And this fibrous structure is capable of capturing small particles from the air that passes through. Here, one main naively thing that uh, the particles would, would be uh, stuck in these meshes because they are too big, so that in a way the structure mesh acts as a sieve, like similarly, like you sieve noodles, for instance. Well, that's not the case. Uh, maybe for the largest particles, but aerosol is much smaller than the typical mesh size, which, you know, from let's say this. The figure here, we can estimate it to be between 50 and 100 microns. So the efficiency comes from different mechanisms. Namely, in this microscopic world, everything is very sticky. So uh, particles interact via Van der Waals forces, and in principle, touching uh, one of those uh, fibers would cause an absorption of uh, small particles to those fibers, so hopefully 
forever. For such touching to happen, uh, it is still not that likely. So there are several mechanisms. And the best way to learn what is happening in such filters is from computer simulations. Now, a typical simulation that I'm showing here would be um, something like that. So these are the fibers uh, aligned in some grid. Uh, and such a combination then combines hydrodynamic flows and uh, Langevin dynamics for small particles that follow these flows. And what we learn from these simulations is that there are at least three different mechanisms that lead to uh, the position of particles through uh, the fibers. Uh, so here, this is a cross section of such a fiber. And then here you see these are air streams that go around the particles. So one thing that we learn from this kind of simulations is that a small particle will not simply hit the obstacle, but the air stream will guide it around the obstacle, which is unfortunate from the perspective of filtering. So such a particle would, would, would get deposited on the surface with some probability if the stream is leading the particle near a surface and therefore it, it will get absorbed. So now what we can imagine is that uh, the larger the particle is, the higher is also the probability uh, for such capturing to occur. On the other hand, if uh, the particle is large enough, so uh, more massive, uh, then when making a turn, it would persist on its initial paths or because of inertia. So similarly, like a too fast car that uh, uh, steers into the skid. And so with this, it tends to uh, collide into the obstacle. And uh, what we can expect is that this collision due to momentum is larger for larger particles. And the third mechanism has something to do with um, the diffusion, so Brownian motion. Yeah? So this is relevant for small particles. So they will, apart from moving with the streamlines, they will also diffuse around because of Brownian motion. And now if we recall that the diffusion coefficient is inversely proportional to the particle size, uh, that means that now smaller particles will tend to deviate more from this streamline. So smaller particles will be more easily captured by the fibers because of the diffusion. So now we have these three mechanisms. So these two are more effective for larger particles and this one. So the diffusion mechanism is more effective for smaller particles. And now we can take a look at filtering efficiency that follow from uh, such kind of simulations. So here is the uh, fiber efficiency versus the particle size. And now uh, this blue line is the first mechanism. So the interception that we discussed, so it, it increases with the particle size. Similarly, with particle size increases this, the second mechanisms because of inertia effect, even though it's way larger than the first mechanism. And then the third mechanism is the diffusion. This is this green line. You see, it's much more effective for smaller particles and then much less for larger ones. And now we can sum up uh, all the efficiencies and calculate the so-called total efficiency. And this is this uh, red line. And what we see is that there is a clear minimum that appears between 0.1 and 0.5 micrometers. This minimum is known and it's a very universal phenomenon. It has nothing to do with the design or structure of the fiber, uh, but it is because of crossover of different mechanisms that we see here. So changing the filter structure, uh, you know, uh, changing the mesh sizes, different, using different materials and so on, will of course uh, change the numbers. So probably also shifting this minimum left right up and down but the minimum will not disappear so these particles here around this range are always the most problematic ones to filter out and uh, this we can also compare to some uh, real experiments so here an example of filtering efficiency of uh, polydispersed uh, sodium chloride particles by N95 respirator. So here, instead of efficiency, it was measured the penetration depth. 
as a function of particle size. So that means this maximum here should be seen as inversely proportional to the single to the efficiency. That means so maximum here would be minimum here, and we see similar behavior. So the, the least uh, effective filtering occurs here somewhere um, for particle sizes, which are in this case around 50 nanometers. Of course, the numbers are different than here, but the same phenomenon appears. These were the basic filtering mechanisms. Now, as it turns out, we can improve filtering efficiency by electrostatic forces. So for that, we can use electric materials. So an electric material is a material that possesses quasi-permanent electric charge or dipole moments. So we can charge such a material. So these are typically a polypropylene or polyethylene polymers. We can charge them. So with this, we get some charge separation. So some parts of the fibers are positively, some negatively charged. So on the outside, the matrix is still electroneutral. Such charge, of course, weakens over time, but hopefully it remains there for long enough, so for practical purposes. So why is the charging of the fibers good? If a fiber is charged, now it can interact with aerosol particles, and this regardless of whether particles are charged or not. So if a particle is charged, then you know, we have a charge-charge interaction, whereas if an aerosol particle is neutral, then still a charged particle can induce a dipole moment in the particle, and with this it causes an attraction to the fiber. So all the cases with this, a charged fiber is more efficient of capturing the particles. And now how does this look like? So here I'm again now showing the efficiency versus the particle size. So this dashed line is a mechanical filtration, so totally neutral filter, yeah, with the minimum that we see before. And now if the filter is charged, now it responds differently to different aerosols. So if an aerosol particle is also charged, then you see that the whole line shifts upwards. So roughly similar improvement for all the particle sizes. If, on the other hand, a particle is neutral, then the, as it turns out, the induced dipole moment is larger for larger particles. So that is why the electric force is larger for larger particles and the improvement is larger for larger particles. So this is a demonstration how with charging we have shifted this minimum to smaller values. Right, so efficiency in any case improves with charging. So that's, that's why uh, most of the professional filtering masks uh, are composed of such kind of materials that are that contain quasi permanent electric dipole moments. And now we come to the last part of this talk, and here we will say something about viruses inside aerosols, and we'll come back to the relative humidity. And in this case, we'll take a look at what kind of role the relative humidity plays on the viruses. Now the first thing is an aerosol particle is hostile to various kinds of pathogens. Why? Well because the conditions here in such uh, small aerosol particle can be very different from physiological conditions. Yeah? So we can imagine that Inside such an aerosol, there is lack of water, the system is dehydrated, um, therefore water has lower activity, um, then higher osmotic stress because of various kinds of solutes inside and so on. And viruses are also less protected from environmental factors like um, high temperature or UV light and so on. So viruses in general will not survive very long in such kind of form. So even though that some viruses are more resilient than others. 
And now we come to the, again, relative humidity. Now let's have a look at the effectivity of a virus inside aerosol. So this is the case for a Langet virus. Here the survival of the virus versus relative humidity at different times. You see, we go from a few seconds, minutes to a few hours. So the virus inside is getting deactivated over time, which makes sense because the aerosol particle is bad for the virus. Now, at large relative humidity, the survival is still quite good. And then if we are decreasing the relative humidity, the chances of survival go down. So it becomes worse and worse for the virus, which is not that surprising because with this, we are dehydrating the particle and we are more and more deviating away from the physiological conditions, of course. Now, the conundrum in this story is that why does then the chances of survival improve again when we go even further down with the relative humidity? So this part here. And such kind of behavior can be seen uh, also in other kinds of viruses, including influenza virus. So here is an, a schematic plot, but the same thing here you see for uh, intermediate relative humidity, let's say at 50%, the chances of survival of influenza is quite low and then it improves with in, in more dry environment. So also this, it is unclear, but okay, the fact is again, that if we compare 30% relative humidity, it's worse for us. So higher probability for transmission to occur than for a bit more moist air at 50%. Now, how to understand this non monotonic behavior? Here, there are no clear answers. Of course, there are only hypotheses. Some are more sound than the others. So, and I would like to discuss a few of them. So, the first thing is the case when the virus accumulates at the surface for whatever reason. So, if that is the case, then we could and imagine that um, a virus that accumulates here, it will get damaged because of the surface tension, shear stress, conformational rearrangements, and so on. Uh, it is also known that at air-water interface, some proteins can get unfolded, which is also detrimental for some viruses. And we can now think along these lines. So if we increase the relative humidity, this aerosol particle will become larger. So surface area will also become larger. So now in the case that for some reasons, so some viruses want to accumulate at the surface, with this, they will have a greater potential for surface inactivation. Now, how about some other more general factors that are applicable even in the cases when uh, a virus resides deeply inside the particle. Now, what we know is that enveloped viruses are more sensitive to the relative humidity. And what we also know is that high concentrations of salt ions can damage uh, the lipid envelope. There are also some other possible explanations like that uh, low relative humidity can trigger also changes in pH and so on, but I will not um, go into that. And now let's take a look first, what are enveloped viruses? Two examples would be influenza and coronaviruses. Um, so an envelope is like an outer coat that protects the interior of the virus from the outside. You know? and the envelope is basically lipid bilayer, which is composed of phospholipids like that. Yeah? So with um, hydrophilic head groups that are pointing out to the water face and upolar tails that are kept inside. Now, these envelopes can also contain some other proteins, sugars, and so on. And now what it's known that high salt concentration can damage a lipid bilayer. Now, the question is, why does ro uh, low relative humidity somehow improve the stability of the viruses? And for this, I will give you two possible mechanisms. So one possible mechanism is 
and so-called efflorescence of salt. So what is that? If you have a water droplet with sodium chloride and then we decrease the relative humidity, then water will evaporate, but the salt will remain inside. And so its concentration will steadily increase. Now at certain point, we will pass the solubility limit of the salt, but due to high energy barriers for crystallization, the salt will not crystallize. So, but it will remain super saturated in water, so metastable. Until we go so much further down with the relative humidity that the salt finally instantly crystallizes out of the solution. So this is the so-called um, efflorescence point. So, and then we get the, the salt crystal. Now, if we want to go into the other way, we need to go much to much higher relative humidities to achieve back the rehydration, and this is the so-called deliquescence point. Now, this is the phenomenon for uh, water and sodium chloride. Now, imagine if we have an aerosol particle, then similarly there, the salt concentration will become extremely large at 50% relative humidity, which can be very damaging for the envelope of the virus. But when we go down to even smaller amounts of relative humidity, then the salt can crystallize out of the aerosol particle and the remaining concentration of sodium chloride in there can be low enough not to have damaging effects on the envelope. The other possible mechanism has something to do with phase transitions of lipid bilayers. Now, lipid bilayers can exist in different forms. The most common is such kind of formation. So this is a fluid phase, L-alpha. So in this phase, you can see the lipid molecules are very disordered and they are very fluidic. So therefore the entire structure resembles some kind of uh, two-dimensional fluid or liquid. And what is also known is that smaller molecules like water molecules can pass the bilayer through, they diffuse through and come to the other side. So it's not very easy to pass it through, but they do on the long run. Also, that means that there is an exchange of water between both parts of the membrane. Under certain conditions, especially at lower water activities, which happens at lower relative humidities, this phase can undergo phase transition into the so-called gel phase, L-beta phase. So in this case, as you can see, the lipid tails are much more ordered and less mobile. So the entire structure now becomes less fluidic and also less permeable to water molecules. So these things are well known and documented in laboratory experiments with pure bilayers. Now the question is, to what extent uh, does uh, this phenomenon appear in, in viruses? So can virus envelopes also undergo this transition? Now, if they do, then you can imagine that if a low relative humidity appears, then the envelope can transit into such kind of form. And with this, it blocks the exchange of material on both sides and possibly it could maybe preserve the interior water inside the virus to escape outside at low relative humidities. And with this, it uh, blocks uh, possible dehydration of the virus. And with this, it keeps it viable at lower relative humidity. So these are two possible mechanisms that some kind of can help to survive viruses of low relative humidities. And with this, I came to the end of my talk. And instead of making two big concluding remarks, I would actually ask two questions. So should we humidify our rooms in winter or should we wear masks? So these are the questions that everybody should answer by himself. And I would like to acknowledge a few people with whom I discussed these topics in the last weeks. So the first one is Sanjay Bozic from the same department of Josef Stefan Institute, then Roland Netz from the Free University of Berlin in Germany, and Rudy Podgornik from Chinese Academy of Sciences and Kaolin Institute in Beijing. And I would like to thank you for your attention.